scale for us in terms of, of really laser focused on the high conversion audiences and then understanding what the ROI is on that second tier audience. Because very often that second tier audience still drives great ROI. And then sometimes it's third, sometimes it's fourth. And you just have, so to scale into like communities is a great way to scale because you can have a predictable result and take some of the wins from there and capitalize new types of communities. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Test, Optimize, and Scale. As you know, I love a good advertising discussion, and I'm excited to have Jason Wood in the podcast studio with us today, CEO of publicly traded Specificity, a, a massive digital marketing firm working with some of the top brands, going to be talking about traffic algorithms, AI, and what it takes to scale performance today. Jason, thanks for taking the time to join today's uh, discussion on Test Optimize Scale. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. I, I Like I said, I've been looking forward to it. Legend in the space, and, and we're going to dive deep here today. Uh, to familiarize listeners, to kick things off, can we start with your background? Where did it all begin, and what got you into the world of advertising? Yeah. You know, I've been I've been a targeting marketing guy my entire career, even pre digital. <clears throat> now I'm not so old that I had a depth of experience pre digital. I'm old, but I'm not that old. Um, you know, for me, uh, I, it's always been an eye towards uh, driving the best ROI out of ad dollars, being able to track them, and that's what prompted me to start this particular agency um, and and take it public. I mean, I had a company before this one for about ten years, same ideology, which is just refining audience. And understanding who you're talking to, because we just think that the output of that approach is just exponentially better. And it's all about reaching the right user at the right time with the right placement. I, I think a lot of audiences, general public audiences, don't understand advertising. They hear data and and you know advertising and just think yeah. bad things. When really it, it's all crafted around the concept of. Let, let's make this a personalized experience. Let, let's give Jason, I'll use both of us as an example. Let's use Jason, the exact type of ad they want to see right now. Well, you know, everybody says that they're concerned about how their data is used. And that is all legitimate, especially when it comes to things like banking and, you know, stuff like that. I get it. Completely get the need for consumer privacy. But I'll add this to it. If you have any friends that live in Europe, especially like the UK, ask your 25-year-old single friends how they like those diaper ads they get every single day on their social <laughs> feeds and how they get ads for denture creams and and just all this generic advertising that comes through the same personalized communications we deal with here in the States, like your social media channels, like your texting um, uh, platform. For me, it's Apple. But it, get, without, without any kind of eye towards data, you're really just relegated to generic marketing. And frankly, consumers hate it. And all the survey data illuminates that. I uh, I enjoy golfing. I enjoy snowboarding. I run a marketing business. I look at investment opportunities. We run a lot of investor acquisition campaigns, and I'm delighted when I see those advertisements. Uh, if I find something that makes no sense, it it it, it throws me off, makes me want to use the platform less. Uh, maybe I pay extra attention. I'm an advertising guy. I watch uh, all the Super Bowl commercials the Friday before. Uh, but but let's talk about that data dilemma a little bit more. So advertising tech, marketing tech. Uh, big tech as a whole. Now, how can we solve the data issue? Uh, I know a couple years ago, uh, March 2021, uh, late April, actually, uh, iOS 14.5, all later updates have limited what we could do in terms of tracking uh, on meta and other in-app uh, advertising platforms that want to track users off app. We have to get creative around we, how we see the data, especially if we're listing on some type of exchange that limits pixel placement. Obviously, you can create a more in-depth environment on an e-commerce store or something like that. But but what are your thoughts uh, towards this data dilemma? What, what are some different ways the tech industry as a whole can address these next steps to you know comfort users as well as drive advertising performance? You know, making everyone yeah. on all sides of the table happy. Well, I think the first thing we have to do as marketers, especially those of us that leverage and harness data to the benefit of our clients and, and frankly consumers alike is first acknowledge what's taking place. I mean, companies like Facebook at the time, now Meta, I mean, they 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 sold our data, man. I mean, they gathered it without our permission. The spirit of the, the user permissions were clearly not 
designed to, to get us to opt in and just giving it away. And they got caught with the Cambridge Analytica thing and they're doing all this creepy personality <laughs> stuff. And, and really, you know, as, as, a, as a consumer audience, we're past that, right? That happened, it's there. But what you have to recognize is they still have that data. They still track that data. The only difference is they're not opening it up to marketers and they're doing that to the benefit of their own uh, profitability model. Like, I don't care if you're talking about Google, Meta, um, if you're talking about TikTok, if you're talking about LinkedIn, programmatic DSP, they all make a living solely correlated to the volume of impressions. It's called the CPM model, as Jason, I'm sure you're well aware. Yep. It is not in their best interest. It does not make their investors happy when they find out ways to help marketers define the audiences they want to convert more narrowly and stop wasting spend. And, and I use this example a lot, and it's not really the nicest example, but it's just a fact. You can build the most brand recognition for Ferrari um, in, the, in the trailer parks you want. It'll never equate to revenue. So that's kind of what Meta is doing, is trying to solve that problem where they're using the dials to get you enough ROI to where you're profitable, but also keep you from being able to go, wow, here's the audience we want to hit. We're hitting a home run with it, and we need to limit the spend to this audience. And even more to the point, if it's really that successful, as a small or middle-sized company, we don't want to have the whole audience because we can't facilitate that operationally because that's how targeted an audience is. That's not in their purview. That's not their goal. And they'll never help you define those audiences. And specificity, that's exactly what we do. We're building addressable audiences outside of ad tech platforms and then publishing them back in. The difference is, and this isn't a specificity commercial, it's just an ideological marketing difference. Understanding that all this data is still legally compliant and, and out there, if you're not going to sell it, you don't need personally identifiable information. So I don't need to know that you're Jason and that you live on this street and that this is your social security number to know that you're a golfer. There's a ton of ways I can find that out that aren't harmful to you, that don't require me to track you to arrive at an audience that's golfers. So then you can layer in intent and all these other things without having to have that personally identifiable information. Publishing that back to ad tech, what that means is we publish a list on device IDs and say, this is who you can serve ads to with this budget. We don't go into Facebook's platform and go, yo, hey, Facebook, help us find homeowners in, in Tampa. Because what they're going to find are people that live in Tampa, kind of, most of the time. Sometimes it'll be Orlando, but you know, hey, it's their algorithm. And so your targeting is so diluted coming right out of the gate. Um, and frankly, just the reason I'm so you know, inclined to jump on this is, you know, you talk about opt test and optimize. How can you test creative? How can you test offers? How can you test messaging if the audience's reactions you're gauging aren't the right audience? What does it say to you if you're Lamborghini and you put out ads and then you put out branding and messaging and test your creative that you got a million hits on this? If you do the deeper dive, you found out 65% of that came from 18-year-old boys looking for a picture of a Lamborghini for their iPhone. Is that a conversion audience? Are you really going to inform your brand on those analytics? And every market has that dilution in it um, and with, with big text data. And I think there's always been holes in data as well, too. And you're talking about the dilution. You're talking about how you have to go layers deep to make sure you're getting the right audience as a whole. Uh, I've seen a lot of small businesses stop advertising uh, on Meta, uh, even Google, some of the platforms that are easily accessible to them uh, want to get into some of the more uh, sophisticated ad platforms and your data as well, too. You're talking about DSPs, demand side platforms a little bit, uh, you know, with the tracking as well. I love how you said they're giving you enough to work off of. They don't need to give you everything. The way I look at it based on stats is if 5% of mobile iOS users have opted in to allow Facebook to track them, which is it sounds a little risky, you know, based on some of the events that you were talking about in the past. But if we still have five percent of users there, plus desktop uh, and a laptop, plus you know Android, non Apple users, uh, I, I project about thirty percent of conversions we're we're tracking. Uh, is it going to be the vanity metrics we saw years past? Uh, you know, is every campaign going to be able to show a ten x? No, maybe it's 3x that's being reported with the pixel. Uh, I, I know there's a list of other softwares you can add if it's your own site. Uh, but but just going off these basic numbers and looking at those as boosters, uh, with those 
analytics, you, you could still optimize towards the audiences that are performing best, towards the creatives. It gives you enough to make data-driven decisions. And then big fan of what you guys are doing with your data uploads, being able to do proper data mining, being able to do proper data ad aggregation to reach the right users, and then upload that as custom audiences, whether we're talking about social platforms, whether we're talking about display banners, sponsored content, video ads, on advertising exchanges, uh, or major media publishers, major advertisers, buy and sell media. You guys, are, of course, are experts at this. Uh, I, I think that's where the best performance comes from. Uh, can you talk more about that audience data? Can you talk more about why that's a better approach than using what's available to you on one of these platforms as if, as if you're one of, you know, thousands of other advertisers bidding on it? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, here, here's, here's the real thing, right? So if you're still manually bidding on, on ad space for digital, you're, you, you've missed the whole programmatic play because if you're feeding it the right data, there's no reason to, to bid on, on ads like we're, you know, mad men from the sixties placing time life ads. <laughs> That doesn't make any sense anymore. Like, I don't even understand why companies still brag about doing that as though the personalized touch somehow benefits them as we all move towards AI. But, you know, really, here's, here's what it boils down to because you brought it up, and that's attribution. If you're leaning into Google for attribution, what you have to do is look at GA4 now, and you have to realize a couple of things. One, they just did away with enhanced CPC. It's gone. Right before the holiday season, no more enhanced CPC. Sorry, marketers. Good luck to you. Please increase your budgets to make sure you hit your numbers. Then you look at the pixel situation. You look at how they're sourcing traffic. If it doesn't start in Google's ecosystem, they just place it all to direct. And they really don't do a good job of showing you what your programmatic campaigns are doing in display. And, and you know, the OTT and the CTV campaign, they, they're not doing anything for you there in terms of Google Analytics. And, and that's, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, that's self-aggrandizement. I mean, they're just doing it. For, for their own vanity of their own metrics. When you control the audience though, Jason, when you understand your audience, not just by you know generic personas and get kind of close to it through ad tech, but actually address it through a contextual layered data apparatus, grab those device IDs and publish them, the attribution models just get buttoned up. If you're restaurants, you do foot traffic attribution reporting, which tells you of all the devices you marketed to, who showed up. Nobody window shops in a steakhouse. If you go to a steakhouse, you're buying a steak. That's the bottom line. That doesn't work in B2B, but there's a ton of other things that do. And when you can start with that device ID and understand the, the myriad of devices that might be relevant, relevant to that individual, you really start to see the confluence of, of attribution really come to light. And you no longer really need to get... Uh, a reliance on Facebook to tell you what converted. They're going to move towards favoring the conversions that only occur on their platform. The problem with that is, you know, for political reasons, for data privacy, consumer privacy reasons, that audience of people that feel most comfortable converting on Facebook or Instagram is going to dwindle over time. It just is. So as that happens, marketers, we already see the need to bounce them out of the platform to convert them. Facebook's not going to favor that traffic anymore. They're already, you're already starting to see the impact of that. And all of that equates to one understanding. If you don't understand your audience and you don't control the data um, that you're marketing to, you're never going to have a fully vested opportunity to track and then optimize because the analytics are going to be a slice of a slice at best. And you're just shooting in the dark at that point. Without that data, without that attribution, how do you know it's working? How do you optimize towards it? Even with the best audiences, even with everything you guys are doing with, with targeting, without that ability to optimize, and that's really where it really all happens, right? Right. Yeah, and the problem is, is when everybody in the industry, whether it's big tech and ad tech or whether it's, you know, brand, whatever it is, everybody in the industry is so leaning into this CPM model as the metric, right? So saturation and all of this, that they're missing almost completely that the motivating factors for the, the ad serving companies, the ad tech, martech, for big tech, for social, is always going to be to push your audiences broader. And if you're selling ice cream, that's great. And if you're selling toothpaste, great. You know, everybody buys those things. But if you're selling an $80,000 window job into the Tampa market, man, there's some things you better know. You better know that, that, Almost half the people that live in that market don't own the house they live in. So living at 13281, whatever way, is a half a million or a $2 million house isn't good enough because a lot of people move down here owning businesses and they lease the house for the write-off 
and they, they own a property up north. So who are you marketing to? And, and what's, what's the conversion look like? And then when you really get into it, Jason, you find out that really you got to have 26% home equity to be the highest likely conversion band in that audience. Because so many people finance it with a HELOC. HELOC over 7% is the, the average value of a window job in that market. Drops you below 20%. Now you're talking about PMI, private mortgage insurance again. Nobody's going to pay private mortgage insurance just to do a HELOC to do a window job. All of these factors, they're all attainable and understandable if you start with the data and quit trying to leverage marketing to arrive at it. I, I like how you're going into so much further depth around the audiences of, hey, don't just go after homeowners. If, if they don't have 26% of equity or more, I mean, yeah. I could hear all of the experience, all the campaigns in the background that have led you to these findings. And I, I think it's so funny that some marketers, some small business owners like to write everything off uh, under generalizations of, hey, Facebook ads don't work. Programmatic ads, I tried that. That's something people did years back. When really, these are just tools. Uh, I, I have a few different example analogies I could point out. You mentioned Ferrari earlier. Uh, one of the top Google ad guys from years back uh, gave me this example at, at some point uh, on a panel of anyone could get behind the wheel of, of Ferrari, but they're not going to be able to open up the capabilities of that vehicle that a professional driver in the right environment would be able to, 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 to perform at. Uh, yeah. to be able to leverage and, and, and you know, it, it's a completely different thing. So to just think, hey, set anybody behind a, an advertising exchange, have, have them bid there, set anyone on one of these platforms and that, you know, an equal result is going to come out is, is really just silly. You're going to be able to do things with those machines that, that others aren't even thinking about. And because of the volume of campaigns you've worked on, because of the success you've had on this, hearing about the precision data targeting, uh, hearing about how you, you know, crack the code with attribution. Can you share more about the approach? Of course, what you can, but anything for, you know, listeners on, on how many audiences to set up, how many creatives, what type of metrics to look for around yeah. the impression metrics, clicks, conversions, you know, what, what can we share that could help steer listeners in, in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, it's important to understand that, that, that big tech has made this play, and it's really obvious to those of us that have been in marketing long enough, um, to really centralize digital marketing. So you've got a whole generation of marketers that don't know anything about pro propensity modeling, segmentation, um, cross-sell opportunities through segmentation, how to build real-like audiences. Because, man, I'm going to tell you, if you think, you, you have it. You hit a vein of conversions on Facebook and you build a like audience. If you think that like audience looks the same as it did pre iOS 14.5, man, are you in for a world of hurt? Because what used to, you know, have four or five layered selects to arrive at that like audience, you're lucky if it has two or three. And you're lucky if those two or three are even scientific. Because as we know, identifying on a homeowner, I mean, they don't have that county API property tax data. So it's contextual. So this guy likes Home Depot. And you know, he bought a lawnmower, so we're going to weight that to, towards a homeowner. But that doesn't make a homeowner. And when you build 10, 15, 18% of slop in, into your campaigns, and then you want to layer in AI into that, all you're doing is getting AI to help you make really fast, dumb decisions. And it'll do it quick, but it's not going to have that, that enriched understanding that you have to provide a tool like AI. So what we're talking about, when we, when we approach a client, it's very often the case that they have a persona or two or three that they're just confident is their high conversion persona. And I think what people get confused is there's brand advocates, people that have a lot of engagement, will share your stuff and all of this because they like you, they like your company, you're doing a great job on telling your story. But if you don't have those demographic and intent categories layered into that, you can get a whole lot of people that love you and nobody willing to take you out to dinner. Because they don't have the money or they don't have the house that require you require for an outdoor kitchen or, you know, fill in the blank. So for us, it's about understanding not just your umbrella audience, right? So not just basic demographics. You have a product and it appeals to different markets for different reasons. Set your campaigns up with the appeal the product has and that audience understanding. We know this audience likes Ferrari because it goes really fast. We know this audience likes it because they have a lot of money and they're not very attractive. So they're likely to Use the Ferrari to get a date. And we know this audience, you know, on and on and on. And, you know, then there's that, there's the social, 
you can segment audiences based on the appeal of a product because that really is, you know, uh, frankly, the put through is what drives the conversion anyway, is hitting that appeal factor at the right time. So as a leader in the field, marketers listening in, you know, aiming to, to use that technology to reach the right audiences with the right appeal from the product, uh, you know, to, to optimize your, your audience targeting and produce real results. Because otherwise, like you said, you, you just, you know, it's the spray and pray approach. And, yeah. and that often doesn't uh, produce the results you need. What we tell small businesses and small business owners and marketers is this, you know, there's, there's a reality, an economic reality to digital marketing, which is there is a point at, that you have to hit a threshold that you have to hit in volume of impressions before analytics become impactful. Sure. So until you can hit that, how do you get there? What we've seen and what we've helped some small businesses not quite ready for, for to capitalize you know, our kind of campaign, instead of going into Facebook and setting up a campaign, go into Facebook and set up eight campaigns with the same budget. Your audiences will be much smaller, but define them by the one select variance between them that you think are drivers. And then watch that. Even though there's slot built into it, the contrast, helps lead to some conclusions. So then you can start grouping them together and not worrying about these two selects because these two are working. Let's try a campaign where both of these are there. Go forward and try to look at look at uh, Facebook like a chessboard, right? It's it's not it's not high action, high impact, but if you, if you play with it in the micro, you can get at some pretty smart conclusions. And one good thing about Meta's suite of tools, Instagram included, is they don't have a minimum spend level uh, that the small business can't meet. So Instead of spending 500 or 1,000 or 1,500 bucks at a geo-approximated audience with some hobby that's all diluted data, sliver it down to, uh, let's go talk to, you know, men between this age, women between this age in this area, and, you know, with this hobby. And then same group, but with this, yeah, and just start piecing these audiences together. Run 10 different campaigns a month instead of one, and you'll start to arrive at some understanding. Yeah, some people like to point at the open targeting. I know you and I have that in common. I, I I like going after actual niche audiences, the custom audience uploads, maybe maybe some of the stuff that's available, but with variants, as you're mentioning, we always have assumptions going into a campaign, but letting the data show us advertisers what's working. Uh, hey, hey, it's 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 audience two, creative C. That's that's really driving. A lot of times we find it's in the uh, the, the landing page, the funnel uh, around the conversion event. But being to being very intentional about what the audiences are seeing all the way through and uh, doing more of what's performing. Yeah, and the customer journey is always going to impact and inform the marketing campaign. Where you see a drop off in engagement, you fix that step. Where you see an abundance of increase or lift, then you try to monetize at that stage instead of taking them down a you know storytelling path, for example. So that's been baked in the cake, I think, for digital marketers for quite a while. What, what I think really is, is missed a lot is that as you're looking at you know, customer journeys, consumer journeys through, through your digital marketing, and you don't really, and I mean detailed, know who you're talking to, the information that, that is gleaned from those activities can really lead you down some wrong roads. And we've seen it with campaigns. We, we've had companies come to us and say, okay, we want to do this audience ID tech with you guys and, and run some campaigns up against ours. So we do that. And, you know, frankly, we win those. But when they say take this creative into this segment, my first question is, okay, why? Because we did this giant campaign last summer, about the same time, surrounding the same event or whatever the case is. And man, it just, the engagement went wild. Engagement, define that for me. What's actionable to you for engagement? Is it a like and a follow? Because that's a brand play. Is it conversion? Then what's the ROI on the spend? And, and when they don't have those numbers at, 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 at the tip of their tongue, then it, then it really, you just have to understand it becomes a brand play and not a conversion play. And those campaigns need to be approached completely differently. Oh, yeah. And so many people don't understand that, you know, branding, direct response, two different sides uh, of the advertising world. 
Uh, right. I've found, you know, a branding campaign, a traffic campaign to build up a retargeting pool to later be converted uh, with, with conversion ads and then measuring more around the performance there. It is good. And if brands try to get into just straight direct response too early and without the right social proof in their ads, without the right, uh, you know, signals to communicate trust, immediacy, a lot of the psychological elements that convert audiences very early then then they're just going to be doomed it, it it can be a balance but but really having understanding of that difference of branding versus dr well i'll, I'll tell you what though i mean you know i, I kind of come from a different school of thought right because you know i'm 47 so out of college getting into marketing and sales and, and, and that whole dynamic guerrilla marketing was a big thing and then All branding right. has always been a, somewhat of a thing but it grew in popularities and then brand positioning became what everybody magnated to with their dollars and just all of these plays. And listen, you can afford to do a branding campaign the traditional way if you're Coca-Cola or Nike and an and errant ad serve to a child doesn't matter because guess what? They drink Coke and they wear tennis shoes too. So there's no such thing as a loss. However, when you're driving a conversion-based campaign or you're driving a branding campaign with the hopes of getting conversions, I think the better understanding to have the really the smartest way in 2023 to, to brand to drive better brand recognition, better social proof, is to drive really robust conversions and deliver a hell of a user experience. Because with social media, we don't have to do our own branding anymore, guys, if we're any good at what we do. We just don't. But you do have to drive a lot of conversions to create the environment where people are sharing and talking and all of that. So that's why, for us, conversion strategy is always at the core of everything. Because I can, I can drive better and, and more actionable branding and brand awareness for a company through a hyper-intensive conversion strategy than any ad agency in the country can do with a new commercial and a new ling jingo, jingle, excuse me, or, or, you know, a new aesthetic or, you know, a rebrand of a color. Man, none of that stuff matters. I can take an awful brand aesthetic to a high-intent audience and make you money. But I can't take the best creative produced by the top agency in the country to an audience that doesn't care and make you a dime. And the brand awareness in that audience doesn't matter because they're not a conversion audience. So let's speak to that a little further because that is a true talent of real value. And you work with some of the top brands in the world. You've run some of the most notable campaigns. How are you able to build that type of partnership with those organizations? Uh, they have in-house marketing teams. They work with a variety of agencies. What separates uh, specificity that allows you to, uh, you know, work on such a monster uh, marketing initiatives? Yeah, I mean, so we, we've done a lot of stuff all over this space. We never get to easy stuff, though, because of our data capabilities. When Circle K came to us, they didn't say, hey, we want to drive more foot traffic into Circle K locations. Huh? -uh. They wanted franchisees, 4 million liquid with a high intent in the industry or possible other state gas station owners to convert to Circle K brands. Like, no, we're needle in the haystack for those guys. You know, whereas when we did a campaign for Harlem Globetrotters, it's, hey, let's go after some basketball fans or some people that have kids that are basketball players and sell some Harlem Globetrotter tickets. Like, that's a different campaign. So, but we never get the, the real easy because the, the real easy is done. AdWords can do the real easy, you know, stuff like that. Just commoditize, generic stuff does the easy. But profit is never found in the easy. The, the, the profit plateaus really, I think, are directly correlated to the deep dive in data you're capable of. It's rooting out those micro segments in volume. So across simultaneously where you get that real profit lift. So when, you know, Precision Garage Door comes to us in Pittsburgh and says, hey, look, you know, we, we were, the, we're the highest price. But we've got the best quality and we really have better, better people doing it. We're not 10 bucks an hour. It's a different model. So we want a consumer that wants warranty and quality and just all of that. So we took their ad budget. We didn't grow at 40%. We cut 50% of the households they were marketing to that, that weren't amenable to that value uh, proposition because they're price sensitive. So just simply removing that and folding that over into frequency, guess what we did? 10x, 15x, 18x their money every single month for the better part of seven years now and, and different technologies. But it's the, it's the ideology. It's the understanding that, that under defining the audience will define the, the, the ROI um, in our book every time. And those are landmark campaigns and results 10, 15 X. I mean, who, who doesn't take that deal? Right. I, I think that yeah. speaks very loudly on why these organizations 
work with you guys? And how do you stay ahead in adopting emerging media technologies, uh, data analytic tools uh, for your marketing campaigns? It seems like you're constantly at the forefront. Is it you know self testing with with the well, organization? <laughs> yeah, I wish it was all of that. But if, if I'm just being straight, it's it's yeah. having your company be led. Uh, by a total geek, and that's me. <laughs> I'm, I'm this guy. I get up at five, five thirty every morning, and I'm not on TikTok looking at football videos. I'm on TechWire. I'm on, you know, Ad World. I'm on all these magazines. Going, nope, that's junk technology. We tried that. No, well, this has a nugget. Hey, Mitch, so I'll send my guy an email. Mitch, I'm follow up this company and see if this piece of their technology is extrapolatable to be used over here. Yeah, that's just how it play. And then you just test it. You just use it, you know. And when you yeah. know something's true. Then, then, then you sell it and, and put the, the onus on your team to make it true. When you know that the technology, the pieces are there, and then my, my team just responds. They're fantastic. I have a phenomenal group of people um, that come to the table with skill, but more than that, with the intensity and passion for what we're doing. The passion is clear. And hearing <laughs> you talk about the answers, I can tell that. Like me, there's a, a nerd out approach to being able to get these campaigns to, to industry leading, uh, outstanding performance metric levels. Uh, yeah. I've heard the nickname for you before, uh, the, the angry CEO. I imagine that gets uh, confused <laughs> with the passion. Is there a story behind that? Yeah, you know, the, the angry CEO comes out because I get on these calls and, you know, to your point, and I, look, I'm never going to name any names because that's not how we do business. And I don't want to do that. But you get on these calls with a big company and they're like, do you mind if we invited our current agent agency to, to the table? No, absolutely not. Let's have the conversation. And they're like, well, we're doing this, this, and that. I'm like, well, great. Let me see the attribution model on that. Well, the attribution is true. No, the attribution on that's not tricky at all. That's it. You get into these and I just get, I mean, I don't get angry. That's not the point. But I'm intense. I'm like, look, here's the bottom line. We're going to call a duck a duck. We're going to own our failures and we're going to point out others because that's how the industry moves forward. When you make a mistake, you own it, you learn from it, you improve upon it. But we're just not scared to point out other people's failures where, when we think it's hurting business. And Meta is a perfect example. I'm the guy that'll stand up and say, look, man, the emperor has no clothes. They are diluting your ad budgets. They don't care. They think you're the only choice. They have trained an entire generation of marketers to be relegated to platforms. Marketers, this whole generation coming up has not been, or not all of them, and I don't mean yeah. it. But, but by and large, the universe, they're all taught softwares, not marketing principles, not data fundamentals, not contextual data layering um, skills. They don't know how to do that. It's one thing to find somebody that likes a product. It's another thing to find somebody that likes a product and has the money for it. It's another thing to find somebody that likes a product, has the money for it, and is looking for it currently. And it's a whole other thing to convert them. And there's about four layers in between there. You don't find on Meta. You don't find on Google. Google literally, in my view, is, and look, I'm not, Google's Google. They're phenomenal. But what they've done with, with their search engine return page is they've turned it into the phone book. It's the, the, inter, the phone book of the internet. I mean, it's, it's you know, plumbing. It's, well, here's 10 close plumbers to you. And that's the influence of YP Online aggregating all those billions. When they, when they shut the, the phone book, the paper version down, they put it all into Google. And so they kind of had some say, I think. And, and the geo-approximating coming up before reviews and all this other stuff. And so now the only thing Google can promise you through an AdWord campaign or through their ecosystem is we will absolutely put you in front of a whatever budget you want to put on a percentage of uh, people that are searching for your product right next to 10 other people that are paying us to do the exact same thing and on the same screen. Good luck. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, That's it's, it. I, I don't... Yeah, and for SEO to still be a thing as much as it is, I just, are you kidding me? So we're going to aggregate traffic. We know Google's going to punish us for a high bounce rate, but we're going to push a volume of traffic that's going to bounce at high rate. Like, what are we doing, guys? You know, it's like a digital marketing. We just can't let certain things go. And I don't know, to, to, to have SEO is one thing, but to capitalize it as a strategy, unless you've got the big dollars in the market, doesn't make a ton of sense. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of, you know, 
false hope with SEO and, and still to this day, uh, you know, shortcuts, growth hacks, both for SEO and PPC, the pay-per-click ads that you're talking about at the top of those yellow page type uh, listings on Google. Right. And it makes it difficult for, you know, uh, an entry-level advertiser to compete uh, with certain verticals, certain keywords, certain costs around that. Yeah. There's just better options out there today. And really like how you pointed out the the modern advertiser and how these platforms have conditioned us to have our hands cuffed to them. Yeah. Whether we're talking yeah, about the very audiences, best you can data. with this software, with yeah. this net, this is, you know, the, the other thing I'll tell you is that if you if, if you really take a look at this and, and, and that paradigm right there is that they promise one thing to marketers and that's data, that's targeting and all this. But then they put out documents all over the place telling the same people you can't target as well as you think you can. <laughs> Facebook just sent out a big email. Facebook, not Meta. Facebook said, or no, it wasn't Meta. Hey, introducing it. I'm sure you got the same email we did. Uh, Meta AI. And then what was the big title? Using AI to broaden your audience. I guarantee you that the CMO of Wayfair went, oh, geez, that's the last thing I want is a broader audience. You got these companies that are, that are doing great, you have great success in digital. And 40% of their ad serving is coming post-conversion in the same product category. Like, how is that great, man? I mean, we're talking 10 or 20 million in digital ad spend. How great for who? For Meta. That's who it's great for. It's great for the retargeting networks, the Google ecosystem. But it's not good for your shareholders, and it sure is not like good for your growth. Or, or <laughs> optimization. I mean, yeah. how am I supposed to optimize a campaign that has one ad set that's open targeting? Sure, I could yeah. view the charts and get a little bit of data, but if I have those eight campaigns like you mentioned, I can see comparatively, you know, upper funnel, mid funnel, low, lower funnel, really a focus mm -hmm. on the performance, the conversions, what's working, what's not, and do more of what's actually driving. Uh, I yeah. definitely know there's ad platforms out there that are more worried about, uh, you know, their CPMs that cost per thousand impressions, uh, you know, getting advertisers to trust in them versus how those campaigns are even performing and the optimization abilities they leave media buyers. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then you've got all the big lead ag or lead aggregators in all these industries that aggregate all these PPC dollars and keep all of that alive. Because I'll tell you what, yeah. if, if PPC campaigns, SEO, and, and search campaigns were solely relegated to conversion data, they simply wouldn't exist because they are not the driver in terms of comparative ROI in and out. It's the necessary dilution and analytics to make them appear. So activity slides in to impress you and then conversions coming up to secure you. It's not what it used to be where you could maximize you know, conversion rates. And if you were willing to put the time and the effort and the testing into it, man, you could really build something. If you're building them in the platforms, you're already, you're, you've got a ceiling. You can be the very best in your industry at using the same thing everybody else is using, but that's your competitive advantage is just being better at this same thing. It doesn't make any sense. You take two Corvettes with the same engine and two drivers. One will win more often because they know how to six shift, but nobody's right. going 275. Nobody's going 275. For that, you need another car. You need another engine. You need a different mechanic, <laughs> you know? And a lot of brands won't commit to that. They won't continue to optimize to it and they get stuck, uh, you know, in the back. Um, I want to ask you a fun question. Uh, you know, we've talked about navigating the storm, cracking the code, the data dilemma, uh, you know, going beyond impressions and precision marketing. Uh, where do you think this is all going? What, what is the future of advertising? What does it look like in 2033, 2050? What, where do you see uh, you know, modern audiences and advertisers connecting through ad products? Well, now you're talking about like the transition to web 3.0. And then you know, we're we're, you know, obviously eyes on that. You're talking about AI. I'll make this point about AI since that's our most acute thing. Web 3.0 is a little bit down the line. You know, brands are building destinations like they did from one one from 1.0 to 2.0, building destinations on platforms. And what did they do there? They really screwed up because they forgot to bring their brand loyal audiences with them. And one acute example of that is how the hell do you think Hyundai turned into a billion dollar company right before our eyes and nobody noticed? It, it was it was during that time period, right? And, and it's it's these Korean brands that just popped and just suddenly. Not only are they everywhere and they're ubiquitous, but they're doing a pretty good job of making a car that competes. And now they're making some of them here. And, and you take a look and go, well, what happened? Well, in this big tech movement to Web 2.0, 
all of the ad agencies forgot to engage them on one O and illuminate the path to two O. And so it just left everybody scrambling and looking around. And there's opportunity for new players into the market. So we're looking at that, that transition very, very acutely because we feel like there, there's a play there. But I'll say this, device ID is where I think everything is going. I mean, I think if consumers want relevant ads, which all the data says, you know, 25-year-old single guys don't want Pampers ads. I think that's pretty fair. Um, but they also don't want their data manipulated. Device ID is the way to do it because it can append you to a human being whom you don't know who it is, but you understand what these devices care about. And we all live our lives through our devices. So we can say, here's a golfer without having to know your name, without having to track your behavior, without having to do any of that. Uh, so I think devices, are, IDs are really the way to go. Everybody wants to move to universal ID, but what's that? Email and text messaging? Oh, please sign me up for more than that. The second part of where I think we're going is the AI play. Um, I, there's definitely a huge play for AI to be very, very beneficial to both consumers and to brands alike. But what I will caution everybody with AI, and we're already seeing it, is the cost per, in, per instance metrics are so low with AI through a channel like email that everybody is going to flock to it. And now everybody is seeing a dramatic uptick and ISPs can't figure it out. These email hosting companies, are, are they've got the technology buttoned out, regulatorily speaking, so that they can inbox and they have the legal compliance to do it. But what's going to happen? We're all going to get sick of email. I think corporate communication is going to move to the cloud. I don't think email two years from now is something we're using on the day-to-day -day in the corporate America the way we are right now. Because I think AI is going to bastardize that channel and just drop engagement. Kind of like what we saw about eight years ago with email. Remember that? I mean, email was great. And it's like we all came to work the next day. and like, wow, nobody's opening emails anymore. Right? So then they came out with a display pixel just to make us think they were opening our emails. <laughs> right? That's how, that's how all that played out. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think relevance is king. I, I, and I think it still will be. And I think consumers want it. They just don't want Meta selling, you know, foreign governments our data. And they don't want Google using the data and AI robot. You know, there's just certain uses we don't want for our data. But to keep me from having to look at Pampers ads or, you know, women's clothing, because I, I don't buy women's clothing, like that stuff, I think that, that's perfectly acceptable use for, for consumers. And there's a reason brands spend so much, uh, even when they're at the top, to get this traffic, to get these eyeballs, to get that presence on any of these media platforms, social media even, but but you know ma mainstream. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and audiences, I, I believe, love ads more than they know, uh, especially when they're relevant. And you know, I really think you're giving the audience some, some good things to think about, if not directly set up for their own campaigns. I uh, want to ask you a few questions, uh, quick around, if you will, around the show title. What what can listeners test out for their own marketing, their own advertising? You've given a lot of great tips around audience targeting and segmentation, but uh, you know, in an attempt to package some actual insights that they can do right after listening, watching this podcast, what are some things that they could test out? I look at marketing as a series of tests. Yeah, so I mean, obviously the audience is big with us, but one of the things that we test a lot is, is conversion device, right? So you've got people and then they have multiple devices. We all have in our own lives devices we're, we're more inclined to actually go through a conversion process with, right? So, and, and then there's the mobile component that we see the ads when we're out and about and the conversion opportunity lies. So understanding between a tablet, a desktop, a smart TV and a smartphone, for example, if you have those four devices dependent to somebody, which one are they looking and which one are they acting? Because that can inform the front end where to start the campaigns and kind of tip your conversion funnel upside down a little bit. I mean, not obviously upside down, but to some extent, at least make it a little bit more of a, a diamond shape because you can get conversions earlier in the funnel if you set up the right things uh, like, like device, likelihood of conversion of device. So we like that. Um, we, we, we definitely like what everybody else likes, right? So testing creative, but, but understanding the audience. So if you can't draw causality, then you really haven't run a very robust test. So if you're targeting a general audience with creative and it doesn't perform, there's all kinds of reasons. But if you're tar targeting a very specific audience and it doesn't perform likely, you know why and you know what to change and you make that change and now you're faster down the road. And then channel. I think this gets missed a lot because ad tech is so ubiquitous. It's everywhere. But we tend to let go of technologies that work for technologies that are new. And when we do that, frequency lowers in those platforms and technologies, thus making them opportunistic again. And I think if marketers understand the confluence of those uh, um, uh, understandings, then you'll see that you really want to take more of an agnostic approach to channel. 
by targeting devices, by targeting audiences, and then just meeting them in the ad space where they exist. Um, but that has to be done with device ID, frankly. That's how we do it. So we publish an audience everywhere. And we know that, you know, Meta is going to hit 63% of the audience. You take that, you know, a chunk of that and yeah. a chunk of the rest and go to, go to programmatic or, you know, uh, whatever. I mean, just all across the board, CTV. You just have to know the amenability of channel. But when you get channel and device nailed down, um, you, you can tip that conversion funnel. Unlimited scale, I, I feel as well. There's just billions of impressions you have access to if you're able to reach that device ID across multiple channels. Tough to do. Uh, great to hear you guys are doing. It explains a lot more about the performance. What if the performance is not there right out of the gate, which many campaigns find themselves in that you know situation? Oh. Uh, and I look at the best marketers, best problem solvers. How do you optimize? What's the best approach? Well, you know, I mean, for, for us, it's always the analytics and it's always understanding and isolating variables that, that we know are drivers of the campaign. So even if you're even if you've got the audience buttoned up or wholly if you don't have the audience buttoned up, you're still going to market anyway because there's still opportunity. I think understanding as 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 you're trying to optimize what is most actionable to the first action that, that you need that that uh, user to take. I think a lot of times we get down funnel too far in our optimization when, when we're looking at ROI and the sensitivity to return and, and, and all of those, you know, ROAS and just all that great stuff that we want to arrive at, that sometimes we miss that first step we need them to take to, to get that, that second tier engagement that can be more meaningful, be more impactful. If you're looking at the difference between your CPM models on video and static, here's what I'll shock the world and say. Video, we all know, drives better engagement. But if you want to talk about dollars on a retail product, I'll make you more money with static. So I can hit more people, and because of our data capabilities, we hit more of the right people. The static ad can be a put through to a web page with your video. So doing that will greatly reduce your CPM from video to static, and you get the same result. And you get to broaden your sword with a very hyper-defined audience. You can get more of them. Um, so that's one of the things we see is just testing those types of things. It, it, it's such a strong point to make that it's not always what looks the best but converts the best so right. look at your placements but actually identify analyze what's driving the most it could be a display banner static versus a rich media video you know interactive yeah. ad what about scale once you find that winning scenario how do you ramp it up any tips any examples uh for some of your largest campaigns to date yeah, so I mean, like, you know, some of the things that we're looking at for scale is we, we try to test into some markets um, and, and button details up in a campaign. So I'll give you an example. So Michelle Foods has a, has a SIR product, and this is a pretty big play. They're very well capitalized. So we're testing in a couple of, of, of larger, greater metro areas. The goal is to understand the similar audience selects, where they exist, because from Kansas City to Chicago are two totally different human beings. I mean, we're all the same. You know what I mean? how we shop, how we buy, because of it's just the, the situational dynamic. So knowing where to grow that to scale is just as important as being able to increase volume without driving up labor, right? So scale kind of should speak to both. Automa you know, automation should be baked into your very first test. I mean, if you can't automate what you do, then what are you doing? It Build that first, then automate. Even if you're running a small business, if you can't say, okay, here's how I do more of it, then you know that you got to start there. But scale for us in terms of, of really laser focused on the high conversion audiences and then understanding what the ROI is on that second tier audience, because very often that second tier audience still drives great ROI. And then sometimes it's third, sometimes it's fourth. And you just have so the scale into like communities is a great way to scale because you can have a predictable result and take some of the wins from there and capitalize new types of communities maybe more blue collar like Cleveland and Youngstown and Pittsburgh. And, you know, as, as maybe you're more, you know, LA and Chicago and New York, that's a great way to scale and do it all simultaneously and then marry the metrics together and see what you see. What you see. And that's, that's, that's where I really geek out, man. I mean, some of the similarities you see um, can help you identify the trends, but it's really the start differences that help you get at the right audiences faster. I can tell how much you enjoy it. <laughs> and what behind the fuel uh, for these campaigns. Uh, thanks for opening up here with the audience today. I think we've given a lot to them to, to work off of. Uh, any final thoughts you want to leave listeners with? And what are the best ways for them to get in contact with you, with specificity, uh, to continue the discussion? 
Yeah, so we're, we're a publicly traded company. Our stock ticker symbol is SPTY. Um, we're on the OTCQB. They can reach us at specificity8.com. They can go onto our website. Um, and, and if you don't want to try to spell specificity, I get it. It's kind of, it's kind of a story behind why, why we named our company something so convoluted. But, um, and it's a great story. I'll tell you another time. But uh, you, you can just look at Jason Wood, on, uh, Jason A. Wood, excuse me, on social media. And I've got a couple public pages. And I've always, as always, the angry CEO on TikTok. But that is our rated it, it, for language. It is our rated. I'll give you that. Give me that. I'll preface that right now. Uh, but we've, we've amassed quite a bit of following in a very short time. And I'll have you know, our following is marketing people. We get serious lead gen out of just speaking frankly about things. No fluff. Need things that are going to result in actual performance. That's right. and that that's something you speak to. That's why I was so excited to have you on the show and have had so much fun in this conversation. Uh, definitely recommend listeners to take Jason up on that and connect. Uh, I think that's a, a very kind offer. And not only does Jason get it, as you've heard him talk about today, he, he's at the forefront. He, he's leading the charge here. Uh, Jason, I want to thank you for taking the time to do this podcast here today. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Thanks a lot for having us. It was uh, time well spent, Jason. Absolutely. It was a blast. It was a blast. And listeners want to thank you for tuning in, viewing in, listening in. We will see you next time. Take care.